Hello, today uh, I'm going to finish the lecture I started on Tuesday, What is Media Anthropology? And I want to begin by addressing the concept of mediation. Uh, to repeat what I said on Tuesday, uh, mediation is a fundamentally human process. It's, it's part of what makes us humans. Uh, most other animals don't do it. Um, to mediate is to act through a medium. And when we talk about humans, what we are talking about is that all human experience is shaped in some ways by the tools uh, and the symbolic systems that we use. Um, we shape our physical and our social and our cultural and ideological environments, and in turn, those shape us. Language, ritual, um, objects and artifacts, technologies, um, systems of exchange, the, the media of exchange, money, and, and the other things we use to um, gift and buy and, and borrow, uh, all of these are media through which we engage in the work of everyday life. This is not typically what we talk about when we talk about media anthropology, however, because this is too big. This is basically all of anthropology involves mediation. Instead, we focus on communication media. And so for most media anthropologists, media refers to the human use of technologies to generate and extend and transform, that is to mediate, modes of human communication. What kind of modes of human communication? Well, through evolution, all of us humans are given a set of uh, an, a particular ability to communicate that we call the vocal auditory apparatus. It consists of a resonating cavity, which is why we can make vowels and have spoken language. Uh, it consists of um, a whole complex hearing process. And that biological technology that we are born with has certain kinds of consequences. So when we talk about media anthropology, we're talking about the study of human engagements with technologies that generate and fix and extend and elaborate on the kinds of interpersonal communication tools that we inherit as biological humans. There's two ways to think about this, or, or, or there's two processes involved in this. The first is what we used to call primary mediation. Primary mediation is how the technologies we call media um, transform the interpersonal uh, forms of communication we have through um, our ordinary uh, biological apparatus. So, for example, when I speak, I have broad broadcast transmission. Uh, my voice goes out, uh, people around me can hear it, uh, people behind me may not be able to, if there's, there's noise in the background, it may interfere with their hearing. When I speak, the people I'm talking to get complete feedback. They get my, they get my voice, they, get, they can see my face making the sounds, they, they catch my body language, and when I speak, Biologically, uh, my words disappear as soon as I make them. You hear them and they're gone, and they only exist in memory, unless we are mediating. So mediation introduces things. Mediation can introduce a lot of things. One of the things it introduces is impersonal forms of distribution. Instead of broadcast transmission and directional reception, you can buy a, a record or download a, a, a CD instead of being present um, while we're making music. You can, um, uh, you may know who the artists are, you may know who the people are who are talking to you uh, and, and, and texting you on your cell phone, um, but you're not having the personal uh, engagement. Um, that goes even further because these modes of engagement can also be anonymous, as in the video that Brad Paisley created where people are uh, inventing entirely different personas on the internet than they have in, in real life. And then finally, uh, one of the most uh, um, typical 
uh, forms of mediation is fixedness. Instead of our words disappearing as soon as we make them, we fix them visually, tactily, um, uh, through recording, uh, so that we have these texts uh, for a very long time. Nowadays, the preferred language for this is we talk about affordances. What does any given medium allow us to do? What are the design features that a particular media um, allows humans to do? Closely related to this is secondary mediation, which has to do with how we use tools because of what we believe about them. Secondary mediation includes first uh, particular sets of socio-technical understandings. Uh, do not catch that word, I'm gonna give you a better word. Um, socio-technical understandings are beliefs about what a medium is, what television is, what phones are, what uh, computers are, and closely related to that, beliefs about what they're for, what we're supposed to do with them, what we can do with them. Well, many years ago, I was talking with a news, uh, a news producer, and uh, he was fascinated by what I was doing. He said, I'm so glad that you're, you're dealing with uh, this notion of secondary mediation, because a lot of people just don't understand that you know, news is a visual medium, and therefore, you know, the way we cover the news has to always be dealt with by the, um, uh, what we can get images for. Well, this is patent nonsense, of course. Uh, from a strict affordances viewpoint, there's nothing that stops you from pointing a camera at someone and having them read the news aloud to you. And in fact, in India, Doordarshan news, that's what they did for um, 40 or 50 years. They were just news readers, sometimes with a map. What the newsman was drawing on was his own socio-technical understandings about what the medium is for and how the medium, uh, in his words, must be. Why does he believe that? Well, he believes it in part because our beliefs about media are always connected um, not to the necessary realities, but to what, um, uh, but to socio uh, and, and political and economic contexts. Who controls a medium? who regulates a medium, who makes use of a medium. In his case, the purpose of news is to make money by drawing advertisers, so drawing audiences. Audiences, they have learned, respond better to photographs and images and video than they do to uh, a, a talking head. And therefore, um, in that news as commodity environment, they believe and, and can actually say, well, news is necessarily a visual medium, uh, even though from an affordances viewpoint, that's uh, a technical viewpoint, that's not strictly true. The term we tend to use nowadays to talk about this is media ideologies. It's beliefs people have about media because of the ways they're embedded in political economy. That's why we call them ideologies and not beliefs. Okay, why media anthropology? There are all kinds of disciplines that say there's media studies itself, which is an interdisciplinary firm. There's a, a media sociology, there's media psychology, uh, there's political communication, which focuses on media. What does anthropology bring to this? Well, in the uh, article that you read for today, Alessandra Ardival comes up with three key reasons why, uh, the three key elements that, that um, media anthropology brings to the study of media that aren't necessarily present in the others. Uh, the first of these is a holistic orientation. The second of these is a cross-cultural and relativistic frame. Uh, and the third is uh, an empirical and ethnographic approach. So let me talk about each of these separately. The first, is the notion of a holistic orientation. Holism is at the heart of a lot of what anthropologists do, uh, how we theorize things, how we think about the world around us. I'll use my the example of my own work with Pokemon, uh, which is what I was really well known for for about 10 years, um, uh, Pokemon in the Middle East. 
Uh, holism involves recognizing that what may appear to be many different facets of a people's way of life, the social aspect, the religious aspect, the economic aspect, the political aspect, the linguistic aspect, and so forth, um, are actually just all facets of the same thing. They're all parts of the whole. And we don't want to get lost uh, and not see the forest because we're focusing on all of the little trees. Here's how that worked out in one of my major, uh, what started out as a little research project and turned in, into a pretty major one. When I was uh, teaching in, in Egypt, I went back to the United States for a conference. <clears throat> when I got there in the hotel one night, um, I'm flipping through channels and I see these cartoons of Pokemon. And I just flipped past them at the time, but then the next day I see Pokemon, or well, Pikachu, on the cover of Time Magazine. And I'm like, well, what the hell is this? And so I started asking some of my colleagues and they were kind of vague about it. They said, oh, my kids are into that, but I don't understand it. So when I got back to Egypt, I started talking to some of my grad students about it. My grad students said, oh my gosh, yes, Pokemon is huge in the private schools. And so I thought, well, I, I got curious about it and I decided to do a little study on it. And, and so, um, I became interested in um, children's play, commodified children's play, and I wanted to look at Pokemon as it played out there in Egypt. Well, what I found out was my, my grad student was right. Uh, Pokemon is primarily present in the schools, and the first school I looked at was um, an upper class school. It was an English medium school. It was private. Uh, it was very expensive. Um, the uh, it, it, uh, Looking at the American school, um, it cost more to go to the American high, uh, middle school and high school per year than it cost to go to college in Egypt at that time. Uh, but there's also other private schools for middle class people who can afford a private school but can't quite afford that, that kind of, of level. Um, so I also went to um, the modern language school, which um, was private and uh, all the kids spoke in Arabic, but the school itself was exclusively in English. And the, the idea was if my kids go to an English medium school and they learn English and they have an American or a European curriculum, they'll have a leg up and maybe get a job with a multinational corporation or uh, get a job with the government working with um, uh, international issues where they get paid more and so forth. So these are the, <clears throat> so I ended up looking at, at, at three different schools at three different sort of class levels, uh, lower middle class, middle class, and, and upper, upper class. Um, one of the things that I learned is that the people in the middle class schools didn't tend to actually buy the games because they couldn't afford them. Instead, they bought a lot of other Pokemon stuff. Whereas the kids at the upper class uh, schools could afford to buy um, Pokemon materials um, that were imported from um, from the United States. Uh, this is especially interesting because they cost more in Egypt because of the import fees than they actually cost in the United States. So you had to be wealthy um, to buy a packet of Pokemon cards that cost maybe three bucks uh, uh, in the United States uh, could cost you twenty dollars um, in uh, Cairo. So. Uh, expense created a divide between what kinds of Pokemon stuff you could get. People in the upper class schools could also afford to buy texts that told them about how other people around the world played Pokemon and they could access uh, internet sites in English about this. Whereas students in the middle class schools um, tended to have to rely on what was available. One thing that became available is Lay's potato chips, the American brand, um, began uh, having these little plastic discs called Tazu. And uh, Tazu are, are a little um, Tazu are a little game that's played in Mediterranean countries that involve these little plastic discs. And um, when you bought Lay's potato chips, you would get a, uh, uh, 
a Pokemon character, um, either, a, either a Pokemonster or Ash or Misty or one of the others, uh, with the name written in Arabic script. And so a lot of them would, would catch these, they'd buy little Lay's potato chips uh, for 50 piastres, which is about 12 cents, and then they would get their little uh, collectible. Um, meanwhile, the students from the uh, upper class schools are uh, learning about Pokemon and how people in Europe and people in the United States and people in Japan are playing it. And they're, they're, they're trying to connect themselves to this wider global world through their Pokemon play. Um, but they have to be careful because uh, not everything that they get is um, legitimate. So these are, are Turkish counterfeit Pokemon materials um, that uh, you might buy at a kiosk, but they're, they're not real, as you, as you can see from the Pokemon card there. It's, it's nothing like an authentic Pokemon card. Uh, there was also really cheap local ripoffs and counterfeits as well. These are more, this is my favorite, Rokemon chips. So they they changed the character both in Arabic and in um, English from Pokemon to Rokemon, uh, with a little squiggle, uh, and then they they ripped off the the imagery and sold these to kids um, uh, throughout Cairo. They're an alternative to Lay's. They they sold for half the price, so like six cents instead of twelve cents. And then something transformed everything. Um, Pokemon shows up on television, uh, dubbed in Arabic. And this was really interesting because it's only the second children's show that ran all year long. Um, the, uh, up until then, children's television was strictly uh, for the month of Ramadan. And the rest of the year, there was no dedicated shows for, for children. Um, for some reason, the, the Ministry of Television picked Pokemon to be the second uh, ever, and, uh, and it, it was huge, and everyone's watching this show. But there's an interesting thing going on. Whereas in the United States and Europe, when they took the Japanese uh, Pokemon, they, they translated the concepts into, into English, and they made all kinds of changes to it. So. Um, uh, although some Japanese terms like Pikachu stayed the same, uh, others like uh, the, the, um, uh, the Japanese character that we call Charmander, um, we took char uh, to burn something and the last, the, the, the suffix of salamander and stuck them together to make a fire lizard. So it's English phonemes, uh, I'm sorry, English morphemes put together to make a new word that resonates uh, conceptually with English speakers. They didn't do that in Arabic. They took the English names, not the Japanese ones, and they transliterated them into Arabic. So this uh, sign that you're seeing here literally says uh, Pokemon in Arabic script, which doesn't mean anything. And neither does Charmander or Onyx or any of these other characters. So this opens up, a, uh, opens up this sort of vacant semiotic space where people can read what they want to into the meanings. And so uh, some group of, of uh, religious anti-Pokemon people from Saudi Arabia uh, began circulating a sheet that, that went all over Cairo. Um, it, it was mostly faxed in from Saudi Arabia. And it had uh, words like Onyx and Charmander and so on. And then it had what they supposedly meant. It doesn't say what language they meant it in. It was just meant to rile people up and create a moral panic against Pokemon. It was claimed that Charmander means say no to God and Onyx means, you know, uh, damn the prophet and, and, and these other terrible things that parents are like, oh my God, what are our kids doing? Uh, and they would start um, uh, panicking about Pokemon. Um, so what we end up with is uh, as this resistance uh, is coming from Saudi Arabia, um, the, uh, the Grand Mufti of Mecca actually issues a fatwa against um, Pokemon saying that the faithful should not buy and, uh, and sell and collect Pokemon materials. And so on the basis of that fatwa, most of the governments of the Gulf states banned Pokemon. But that didn't happen in Egypt. Um, in Egypt, 
the, um, they don't care what the Grand Mufti of Mecca says, they care what the uh, Sheikh of uh, Al-Azhar University says, and they did not issue a fatwa. So it continued to be bought and sold, but there was this huge trend of people who were listening to what was going on in Saudi Arabia and creating a moral panic locally there in Cairo. Um, okay, so what's going on here? Uh, the reason I bring all this up is that it shows you how I started out, I wanted to look at children's play. Play led me to school and education and you know, people's thoughts about kids playing uh, Pokemon in school, which led me to issues of social class because schools are divided by social class, uh, upper and middle and, and, and you know, upper upper and, and middle upper and so on. Um, and social class is determined in part by what you can and can't consume. So the whole consumption of Pokemon is, is, it gets linked in there. And that leads me to questions about technology. What kinds of technologies do, do people have? Game Boy technology versus little plastic discs. Um, which leads me to questions about global trade, which leads me to questions about marketing. Marketing takes place in multiple languages. So that leads me to questions about language. Um, Language is tied to social identity, so now I'm looking at issues of social identity, and, and then that leads me to religion and to this, this uh, odd religious resistance that, that emerged, that, that came to us from, from the Gulf. And so what starts, for me to talk about Pokemon, I can't just talk about play. I, all of this stuff comes together. And this is what we mean by holism. Okay, the second thing that uh, Elisenda says uh, happens in um, uh, media anthropology, that media anthropology brings to the study of media, is a relativistic framework. Relativism is a um, methodological tool that anthropology developed in the late 19th, early 20th century when we began to realize that we would take these European concepts like religion and politics and economics and family, and we would go to people uh, elsewhere in the world and because of their very different life experiences, because of the very different ways that they divided up the natural world and the social world uh, and the supernatural world, if, if they have a supernatural world, um, they had different categories for all of this. Um, it wasn't a simple substitution. Uh, different people see things differently based on their different life experiences. This has a really important implication in that it, relativism helps us decenter the West. One of the things that early media scholars used to assume is that technology drove media use. That, well, the way we use television, the way we use these new media technologies, smartphones and so on, uh, stems naturally from the technologies themselves. And therefore, other countries that are later adopters will use them in the same way we do. They're just getting there late. That turned out to be wrong. And anthropologists knew this ahead of time because of our, our earlier experience with, with cultural relativism. What people do in the United States and Northern Europe with their media is not necessarily what people elsewhere in the world do with those same media. And so um, what we, we, we can't assume going in that we know what's going to happen, which leads us to the, the bigger point, which is that anthropologists go into situations um, with the assumption that we don't know what we don't know. Um, we know that we don't know how the locals are. There's a, a whole set of things that we believe we know. And then we encounter others who believe they know something different and we have to try to make sense of that. If you can't take your assumptions 
from your society and apply them to the to the other society just by changing the terms around if you have to totally rethink them it requires you to take an empirical approach and uh, the um, and that that derives from our, our very relativism um, when I go into the field I have sets of things that I believe uh, I believe them on the basis of my own cultural upbringing. I believe them on the basis of my own experience. When I went to India, um, I had been a political journalist, and there were certain things I thought, well, you know, this might be differently culturally inflected, but there's certain things that are going to be the same. Um, but then you get into an encounter, and you suddenly realize that, no, they're not. <clears throat> and that moment of encounter is, is where you encounter rich points. Um, when I discovered that, that New Delhi had 40 daily newspapers for 20 million people, whereas uh, Los Angeles, which also had about 20 million people, uh, had uh, two daily newspapers. And so I'm thinking, well, what's going on here? And I'm assuming it's about markets. I'm assuming that it's about, um, uh, you know, people are, are looking and they're saying, well, which one has the best news for the money? But in fact, it turned out to be about identities. Uh, it turned out to be about where you were from. Um, people in Delhi, uh, oh, even if they're born in New Delhi, they always claim they're from you know, somewhere else. My parents are from Maharashtra, so I say I'm Maharashtran. And uh, certain newspapers are associated with particular regions. So even though it's the New Delhi edition, uh, because my family came from Calcutta, I read Statesman. Because my family came from the South, I read the Hindu. Um, because I came, this is this is not a way that we think about how news gets marketed. Um, and so this was this was this extraordinary rich point. And and I, you know I so I I found that, and then I kept having more and more of these encounters, and all these other rich points to unpack, and then I start connecting them up holistically, and that's how I do anthropological analysis. The tool through which we have these encounters is what we call participant observation. So this is a newsroom where I'm hanging out with the journalists, um, talking to them when they have time uh, about what they're doing, observing them when they don't have time for me. Um, and the idea of participant observation is that when we enter into a media practice or, or any other social practice, we participate as fully and thoroughly as the people engaged in that practice will allow us to. We use their language. Uh, I had to learn Hindi to do work in, in India. Um, we use their language. We, uh, we, we participate in all of their activities. We go out to their restaurants. We, we, uh, we eat their food. We, um, uh, as much as they will let us. But at the same time, we are always observing what's going on from a, uh, uh, from a kind of distancing perspective. What's going on here? What can I record? Um, what can I count? What can I, what can I scientifically um, uh, describe? And so what we're trying to achieve is a set of, of field notes, a set of, of, of descriptive uh, passages that are observational, but at the same time, uh, bring in a local perspective. Um, we are cognizant of their categories as well as our own categories. And um, our, our work uh, develops in the tension between those two. Um, the text that we write on the basis of that uh, we call ethnographies. And this is a, a number of contemporary ethnographies of media um, ranging from the late 1980s to um, uh, the last couple of years. I'm not going to get into this now, so I'm going to I'm going to stop here. Uh, we'll talk about identities and alterities and uh, other kinds of things later in the semester. But I want to stop here because this is where uh, we're going to be moving on to the. Um, uh, to the work you're going to be doing uh, in the class.